Hi, everybody. This is Mitch Weisberg from EdChat Interactive. Uh, I want to welcome you to our, our really interesting discussion tonight, which will be on digital citizenship. Um, digital citizenship is, is especially apt today because uh, it, it used to be probably two or three years ago, we were thinking, let's protect kids from the Internet. And schools put up all kinds of walls to prevent kids from using the Internet. But today, with bring your own devices and with um, with tablets and, and many schools doing having computer labs and some schools having one to one uh, one to one initiatives. Um, we can't we, we understand it's not about keeping kids from the Internet. It's about getting them to use the Internet appropriately. And our guest speaker tonight, uh, Jason Oler, is going to be is, go is going to be talking about that. Like, how do we get kids to use the Internet appropriately so that there's an advantage for them, but uh, they don't do anything stupid. So what I'd like to do first, I know a couple of you probably saw the um, saw the video that we play at the beginning, but it's only a minute. And I just want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to understand how Shindy works, because it's really is a different platform than most people are used to. So I'm going to play the one minute video. Let me just move over to it. And um, and, and I'll be over here on the side, and here we go. Welcome to Shindig, the video chat event provider. This video will guide you through our basic features. Click on any participant's image to engage in a private video chat. Double click on another participant to add them to your existing conversation. Click the arrow to exit. You can also send an instant message, either to an individual or to your entire room. Want to interact with the host? Use the buttons on the lower right. Click raise hand to signal to the event administrator that you want to be brought on stage. Otherwise, submit a question to the host via text. If the system has not automatically detected your webcam and microphone, roll over your image and click settings. Click your image to enable your working webcam. Choose a working microphone by selecting the option with volume indicators that flash green in response to your voice. We hope this was helpful. Enjoy the event. Okay, so so I do want to just show a couple things here, just that that uh, are are mentioned in the video, uh, but aren't um, aren't aren't necessarily emphasized. That the raise hand and ask question buttons underneath your icons. Uh, those two buttons, the raise hand button allows me to know that you'd like to talk to me and I'll either text you or um, or I'll chat with you uh, via video. Ask question is yeah, asks a question that really only I can see as the administrator and what I'll do is if the question is a technical question I'll try to answer it. Uh, if the question is for Jason, then I'll find an appropriate time and alert him to the question. But the other thing that you can do is when you uh, move your cursor and, and hover over your icon, you see that you have these five icons here on your screen. And the icon that says I am allows you to chat. And if you use that, you can chat to everybody who's who's here in our session tonight, or you can chat to one one particular person. Uh, the only issue there is that I, as the administrator, can't see it. So, uh, so if you have something that you want the other participants to see, or if you have something that you want Jason to see, enter it into I am. If you uh, have something that you want me as the administrator to answer, uh, raise your hand or use the the ask question button. Uh, what I what I'd like to do is well, just before I introduce, I, just, I do want to say that we have two more EdChat Interactives coming up uh, on November 12th, which is tomorrow for us. We have Zachary Walker, who's uh, talking about teaching the last backpack generation. If you think about it, you know, these are kids today and kids in the future are going to be brought up digitally. But schools, we're still using textbooks. And so, the, so how do you teach when the kids are digital and the materials that you're using are printed? Uh, so Zachary is going to, going to be addressing that. And then next week, we're going to be talking about how to use games to teach diverse classes. How do you uh, diverse classes in terms of abilities, but uh, also in, in uh, inclusive classes. 
So we'll have Anne Francis, who's going to be talking next week uh, on um, November 17th. Uh, and you can sign up for either of those by going to www.edchatinteractive.org. So now I'd like to I'd like to bring up Jason. So I'm going to I'm going to stop this and let me bring Jason up. Hey, Jason. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Welcome, welcome to EdChat Interactive. Thank you. So, uh, so, so, I understand. You know, you you and I were talking before, and I think one of the things it's always interesting to find out what what other things people do. And you mentioned that you're a composer, um, and that you, you have this the new Yamaha um, and piano. Could, yeah, and it, maybe you could just. I think it's fascinating, and hopefully everybody else is. Can you just describe it to, for people? Okay, a, a slight detour from digital citizenship. Yes, but, yes, um, just because it's interesting. Just because it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> Yamaha has managed to construct a piano that is actually half piano. So from the keyboard to the hammers that strike, it's a real piano. I blindfold you and sit you in front of their nine-foot grand and the N3, and you can't tell the difference in terms of response and feel. Um, and then it only becomes digital when the hammers come up instead of striking strings, they strike sensor pads, which fire sounds, which are sampled from their nine foot grand. So the difference is very slight. The cost is far reduced and you can plug it into USB so you can record a garage band and you can do all those digital kinds of things with it. And so I'm just, and it never goes out of tune. Yay. Right. So it's really a tremendous amount of fun. No, to me, that's why we don't want to keep kids away from the digital world. Okay. It's just another example, but we want them to take advantage of it and be safe. And so that's kind of the segue into your topic. Um, sure. So, yeah. So, and I think what you're going to be doing is you're going to be sharing your screen rather than showing slides. So I'm going to. Let me, let me talk okay. for, for just a minute. There are only three of us here. And so given that, um, we'll make this more of a conversation. And, mm -hmm. But actually, if everybody wouldn't mind, I would love to hear what drew them to a, a an ed chat about digital citizenship and what they might hope to get out of it. So I think what would be helpful then is if the people here here, if you could go into the IM window and you could put in what what drew you to this EdChat Interactive. And uh, again, I can't really see the results, but uh, Jason, you can see the results. Maybe we can get Kim to uh, to put in the reasons why she came. Okay. And is she entering and so those? I'm not. Where would I be looking? I have the conversation uh, you, with you open. Okay. Um, well, if you hover over your icon and go to the IM and open up IM, you should be able to see that there's an IM that you can talk to any everybody. Uh, gotcha. gotcha. Okay, gotcha. Or do they have audio? I'm happy to. Um, so, to so that's a good question. I don't know if Kim has audio. I um, because she doesn't have video. Okay. So usually that's a sign that she doesn't have audio, but hopefully that she does, that she can't actually talk. But Kim, if you can enter something into the IM window, she did. oh great, okay. And maybe you know maybe you can say whether you have audio or not, whether you can talk to us. So um, no audio, okay. So Kim is taking the ISTE Digital Citizenship Academy. Mike Ribble uh, basically put that together and wrote the book Digital Citizenship in Schools. And he and I created the ISTE PLN on Digital Citizenship. And he and I and uh, Mary Alice Curran will be sponsoring the next Digital Citizenship Summit and creating the Digital Citizenship Institute. So Mike and I are, are partnered in, in everything digital citizenship these days. So good. I hope, that's, uh, I hope that's working out well for you. And Mike's a great guy, and he's got a ton of knowledge. 
okay Sam I'm looking at Sam nothing that's okay so here's what I thought I would do and I will keep the this chat open so I can respond um I have a digital citizenship presentation let me orient myself first of all if I sit like this it looks like my ceiling fan looks like a propeller beanie so I should probably go with this okay um I have a rather long digital citizenship keynote that I've done many times, and I have drastically shortened that to leave room for conversation and activities. And so I'm just gonna run through that. And um, depending upon your needs, we'll head in different directions. And I might so, ask you some questions based on what you're showing yeah, as well. Sure. So let me go ahead and... Do you want me to allow you to share your screen now? Yes, please. I have to allow. Okay. So we're waiting. Yes, run. Okay. There you go. So Okay, shared. Okay, and if you want to follow up with me, uh, it's just my name, jasonoller.com, at LinkedIn, Gmail, Twitter, everything. Do be careful. There are a number of Jason Ollers out there, one of whom has quite a gun collection. Another one has <laughs> auto mechanic skills I wish I had. Uh, another is apparently a miniature golf champion. Another is having a tiff with the federal government over his land. None of those are me. So if you want to see me, you got to go to jasonoller.com. This part of what I'm going to show tonight is basically driven by two questions. Do your students have opportunities to explore questions? about their digital lifestyles quite frequently in schools the answer to that is no if the answer to that is no you probably don't have a digital citizenship program and do we want our students to live two lives or one right now i have a new book coming out called four big ideas for the future and one of those ideas centers around the fact that we now all live two places at once Wherever we go, we take our smart device with us, and we are constantly immersed in that second world that is connected to the vast resources of the Internet. And that is now the new normal. And to those people who say, well, I can just turn my phone off anytime I want, I say, but you don't. So that is now the new normal. So do we want our students to live two lives, which they currently typically do at school? turning off and powering down when they enter the school, and then turning back on and powering back up when we're not looking during study hall, at lunch, and so on? Or do we want to take on the task of helping them integrate those two lives into one safe, inspired, savvy, responsible approach to life? And I would suggest to you that we will be judged in the not too distant future by how well we did that. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna give a bit of intro about digital citizenship. I'm going to share with you seven talking points um, that I usually share actually with parents about students and children. A bit about what I think teachers roles are these days. And then whether we do the activities or not, I want to show you how I approach digital citizenship. It's quite often approached as a list of do's and don'ts, which I think is the wrong approach. I approach it from a much more positive, interesting, and I think fun perspective, and one that engages their higher order ethical thinking skills. And so we'll look at an activity I called You're in Charge, in which I put students in charge of making the technology, internet rules and policies for their schools. Amazing things happen 
when they do that, even if it's just a thought experiment and the power you're offering them isn't real, they hop into that mode very quickly. And the second is ePortfolios as the antidote to negative digital footprints. The bottom line for me is, yes, I want students to be engaged. We hear students being engaged and it's important they be engaged. I absolutely agree that I absolutely agree that they should be engaged, but I also want them to be reflective about their engagement. And I will tell you, this is the personal disclosure part of the presentation. I will tell you that if I talk to educators and parents and business people about the other things I do in life, digital storytelling, new media literacy, digital narrative, all those, all those other kinds of things, art and technology, music and technology, they lean forward and they want to know more. The minute I bring up digital ethics and digital citizenship, they sort of move away. It's a very, it's seen as a very heavy, complex, confusing, daunting kind of topic. And our job as educators, because we know how important it is, because we want our students to grow up to be ethical human beings, particularly given the power they have in their smart devices, our job as educators is to help them navigate those ethical waterways in ways that are safe, responsible, inspired, and not lose the excitement about being a digital citizen. Just so you know, the digital citizenship movement started, in my opinion, long ago. I created my first master's in educational technology in response to personal computing many years ago. So we're going back to the early 1980s, the, the days of Apple IIEs. And if you know what an Apple IIE is, then you must be a member of AARP. They were great little computers. They were the first computer to me to be both useful and lovable. And I helped create this master's in ed tech for teachers with the understanding that I would only do so if we had a course on the social impacts of technology. Everybody else, oh, let's do it, let's get it out there. Let's figure out ways to integrate it into the classroom. I love all that, I do all that. Uh, you heard earlier, I, I have, a, I have a very expensive digital piano. I have multiple screens in my office, but I also have that very real part of me that wants to set everything in a broader context and wants students to grow up to be healthy, big picture kinds of people. So I taught a course for many years called the social impacts of technology. That area, broadly known as the social impacts of technology, morphed into dig, uh, digital citizenship when networking came along and we could gather and collect online and form communities and then of course issues about what it meant to belong to those communities came to the fore and thus the term digital citizenship. I will tell you that the digital citizenship term is problematic I'll give you an example why I was doing a presentation to parents one evening. And at the end of that presentation, a man in the audience raised his hands and asked, so when you talk about being a digital citizen, do you mean versus being an American? And therein lies the issue. Unfortunately, the term citizen and citizenship has a particular political valence to it that can be problematic and what you're trying to talk about are the ethics responsibilities and opportunities of being an online citizen uh, mike ribble and i spent many hours talking about this issue finally decided digital citizen was about as good as it was going to get there are others out there that i like and that he and i are considering digital maturity I really like. Anyway, it's an ongoing discussion. I want all of my students, I teach PhD students in the field of media psychology. I teach MAT students who are gonna go be teachers. I want all of my students 
to understand the technology connects and disconnects. Every technology does that. The microwave is a great example of that. I'm sure the people who invented it didn't think that what they would end up doing is making family dinner obsolete, but that's what it's done technically, not socially, technically. Because when a seven-year-old can open the refrigerator, take out a packet, stick it in that machine, hit a couple of buttons, and feed himself with basically nutritious food, nobody needs to eat together at the same time anymore. And I'll tell you something very interesting. During the crash, um, during 2008, my wife and I went house shopping. The older homes, we noticed, had dining rooms. The newer ones didn't. Sort of feeding troughs attached to the kitchen. They had family rooms. Family rooms have at their central focus a large screen TV. So that room that I grew up with and where I went every evening and our family talked had been replaced by a room in which if you talk, people probably asked you to be quiet because they were watching a movie. So bottom line is all technologies connect and disconnect, and we know that only too well with our cell phones, which connect us to people halfway around the world, while the disconnects from the people we're sitting next to. So imagine you're at parent night, and I have I talked to lots of parent groups about digital citizenship and their concerns about kids being online. I find that if they're honest with me and I, I make them feel comfortable, they will eventually tell me how afraid they are about their kids being online. We've all heard the, the stories, and they're not just stories, they're news stories about uh, kids being lured into really dangerous situations online. And so they have every right to be concerned about children safety first. And so I try to give them perspectives that will help them manage that situation and become involved in their kids' digital lives. And so the first and the most important thing I tell them is this. You need to have great relationships with your kids. And I know that sounds like something that should have preceded the digital age, and it did. And I know it sounds like something really obvious that should be true no matter what, and it is. But the reality is that there is no way to know really what they're doing online unless they tell you. You can install software that records their keystrokes. I'm here to tell you they will figure out a way around that. So the idea is to keep them thinking and talking and not ignore the topic. That means at dinner, you sit down and you ask them, so what do you think about the whatever it is? Open up Google News, hit technology. I just did that. And we now have robots that reproduce themselves. What do they think about that? We want to keep them thinking and talking and talking. And I tell them, I advise them to depersonalize the talks. And here's what I mean by that. If I ask somebody, if I ask a teenager, do you have multiple accounts on Facebook or whatever your, your social media platform is, and there's a good chance it's not Facebook because too many older people are there, they won't want to answer that question. But if I ask them, why do you think people have multiple accounts and don't personalize it, they will talk to you. They will talk to you about their lives without really realizing that they're talking to you about their lives. And we desperately need their perspective. They need our wisdom. We need to understand their experience in their media scape. We want them to develop those meta perspectives to be able to draw back from the screen and ask those kinds of questions. And then when they do talk to us and they inform us about what they, why they think other people do what they do or how they view online behavior, honor their experience, we thank them. We thank them 
as experts. That doesn't mean we agree with them. It means we thank them for being honest and sharing their insight. We need desperately to draw them into the conversation. You will hear Mike Ribble, Mary Alice, and I continually lean on this button. The key to good, solid digital, the key to good, solid digital citizenship is student involvement. We need to bring them to the policy table. If I change one thing, one thing about how we approach digital citizenship, it would be this. I would have students at the table when policies about internet use and technology use are developed. Right now, what happens is because they don't have opportunities to explore questions about their digital lifestyles and they're not impulsed and they are not empowered to create policy, they frame the system rather than because they cannot develop policy, they frame the system, they game the system rather than frame the system. They game the system rather than frame the system. And we want them framing the system. We want to say to them, this is your system, how would you frame it? If we don't, if we just give them the rules, then they tend to do an end run around the rules. And I will tell you, that when I put them in that position, they become very adult-like very quickly. So we bring them to the policy, we bring them into the policy making procedure and the automatic response, and I see this time and time again when I work with students, is that they want to frame the system rather than game the system. Also important is that they triangulate, that we triangulate. Every school district I have ever worked with will tell you that it is not just a school issue. Because the second world that they take with them wherever they go, crosses all boundaries, goes with them to parties and home and to school, it is now a community-wide home, student, school, community issue. And so policies that get developed should be widely shared, not just between families and students and schools, but with the community. There's no better place to focus the need to share the responsibility for digital citizenship than talking about your digital footprint. And I'm sure you've all heard that phrase. Some call it a digital tattoo because footprints can get washed away. Uh, digital footprints can't really, and they're more tattoo-like in that respect. And I will talk about how to approach the digital footprint in a minute. Uh, through the year in charge activities that I was talking about earlier. And lastly, I counsel parents to share awareness, not fear. I understand the value of fear. Um, I'm a grandparent, so I understand the value of having my kids being afraid to play in the street. But the reality is the older kids get, the better served they will be if they understand the risks of situations so that they can transfer that understanding to new situations and or know when to contact adults when the situation looks risky. That's better achieved awareness than through fear, in my opinion. Okay, let's talk about a few of the activities that I really love to engage students in. My ideal job is I do a keynote someplace and then I always volunteer to go to a school 
or talk to parents and do these kinds of activities. Um, I can only get so far with the heady kind of stuff about digital citizenship and ethics and so on. It really, um, <clears throat> people can only connect to it to a certain extent. But when I engage them in an activity like this, things change. So here's what I do. I say, there are new technologies that are coming right down the pike. One of the chapters in my new book, Four Big Ideas for the Future, is called Trends That Bend, and it looks at five different uh, technological trends. I'm not talking about gear like 3D printing and, and the maker movement and all those kinds of things, which are sort of subsets. I'm talking about the big ones, big data, immersive reality, and so on. Well, one of those certainly is uh, the ability for technology to enhance us neurologically. And we will see headlines and future news stories like this in the not too distant future. Math Hat makes students STEM ready. Citing the need to pass standardized tests, a family sues the school district for withholding neurological enhancement. That's coming right down the pike. And it will start first with something that you put on your head. And granted, that's. But uh, we'll turn that over to Jonathan Ivey at Apple, and he'll make it beautiful. And the question is if your child could wear something on his or her head that improved their math scores by 10%, which this claims to do. Should we have math hats in school? That is the question that I pitch to students. And it takes them totally by surprise. And I'll tell you the response I usually get. Yeah, sure, God, I want to improve my math scores. Who wouldn't want to improve their math scores? And it only takes one to say, no, this is going too far. Uh, it wouldn't be me. Without my hat, I'd be math dumb. And it wouldn't be fair to people who didn't have the hat. And I prod and I poke a little bit and I say, well, what does, how, what, how is that different than having a calculator or using Excel? Fascinating kinds of conversations ensue. And I am watching as I do this, students have thoughts that they're capable of having that are important that they have in terms of framing the digital environment, the environment in which they're going to find themselves as they progress into adulthood, but which they don't have because there's really no place for it in the curriculum. And it's very sad. It's a very test-driven culture we live in, and there's very little room for these very, very important topics. So then we get practical. I say, well, they're coming. So what are the policies? And I've done a, a bit of a study because I take notes every time I do this about the kinds of responses uh, they, they provide in response to policies and so on. And they're fairly predictable. Uh, can't use them during a test. Can only use them when the teacher says so um, and so on. But it always generates interesting conversation like, well, if we can't use them during the test, why would we use them at class? Can we use them at home when we do our homework? And so on. And they're left to sort of figure all that out. There are no definitive answers, but as long as they're asking the questions and they're aware of the issues, then I feel better about things. With Google Glass, which has died off for the moment, but it will most definitely be back, probably in the form of contact lenses, not too far down the road in terms of implants. And they, as students or parents, are going to have to go to school board meetings and have the very tough discussions about whether or not to include those technologies in their children's lives. And if so, under what conditions? <clears throat> you know, we can get freaked out by this. We can say, oh my God, there are so many ethical issues. 
But if I change my tone of voice and go, wow, there's so many ethical, if I change my tone of voice and say, wow, there are so many ethical issues, then, then it becomes an opportunity. It's all in your tone of voice. Look at it this way. Never have we had so many opportunities to develop students' ethical selves. However, if we don't take advantage of those opportunities, then this is all downside. The opportunity is there for them to think deeply and broadly. And we've got to take opportunities that present themselves to do that, or it's just a huge confusing inconvenience. It's really, when you get right down to it, our chance to dream, to reinvent education by looking at it through a much larger lens. And I'm a big proponent of teachers becoming ethical coaches. And you may already feel that you are, but there is a lot of resistance out there on the parts of parents and school boards about the degree to which parents can ethically coach their children. The concern is, of course, that they may coach them in ways that are inconsistent with the ethics that they receive at home. But the reality is that every use of technology in the internet is imbued with ethical implications, and we need to give teachers the latitude and perhaps the training to be able to address those situations as they arise, not at the end of the week or the end of the day. This is very much an on your feet kind of coaching that needs to happen during the course of a school day. Okay, so what I think I'm gonna do at this point, what time we've got, okay. So we've got about 20 minutes. And what I think I'll do is bring up the first activity and let's just talk through that activity. These are my you're in charge activities, the framing versus gaming. And Google Glass, let's do Google Glass. Okay, so this is typically what happens. Um, I ask students this question. And again, Google Glass is not here. It will be back. I absolutely guarantee it. It's just a question of in what form. And so I pitch this to students. Should we allow Google Glass and similar technology in schools? And under what conditions? And with that, let's just have a conversation. And I think I'll stop sharing my screen. And I'm back up. Great. So, so I, I I heard your question about the Google Glass, and I've been aptly or ardently listening to your discussion. And one of the first things that that dawns on me is that really what you're saying is that we can't teach digital citizenship. You know, that we have to draw it out from people. It's 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 not something that we can say. Here are the here's the recipe on being a good digital person. It's a matter of having people through our prompts develop uh, their own uh, actions and ethics around how to be a good digital citizen. Is that misconstruing what you're saying? No, yes and no. Um, I don't see them doing this. Uh, I see them doing all of this with our help. Uh, mm -hmm. I see them at the policy table with us discussing these issues. Yep. I think the value in having them there, we're going to gain incredible insight as to their digital lives and their often subterranean lives on the internet and how they see their mediascape. And frankly, they need our wisdom and our experience and our guidance. 
And I think it's a great opportunity to collaborate and to bring those two data sets, if you will, together. I think. So you're saying that we don't necessarily know best. Also, if we're learning from the students, I mean, we're we're the older generation. Aren't we the, the ones who know stuff? And shouldn't we be imparting our wisdom to them? Well, that's the empty empty bucket theory. Just pour in our wisdom, and I think wisdom is developed and perhaps shared, but it's it's internalized if it's to be effective. Mm -hmm. And I hear all sorts of interesting things from students, like. Uh, was from a high school group who, when I tasked them with coming up with the policies related to cyberbullying, said we need to do something for the cyberbullier as well. Let's go ahead and levy whatever kind of punishment you need to and make sure the bullied is safe and so on. But somebody's bullying somebody else because life is not what it should be for them. And taking away their internet privileges isn't going to change that. It's just going to surface somehow else. So part of the equation is to get to the root of the reason that they had been so mean to somebody. Mm -hmm. And so I, I get insights like that, and they're fascinating to me. But the important thing is that students have an opportunity to think about these issues rather than have us do all their thinking for them. There is the theory out there in neuroscience and neurobiology that our ethical selves, our, our brains are not fully developed until we're somewhere in our early 20s and that our front frontal cortex, which is the seat of our ethical reasoning, is not fully, is the last part to get fully developed. And we obviously can't sit around and wait for students to become 22 to make an ethical decision. And when I talk to experts in the field and I say, well, how do we deal with that? They tell me there is only one way to deal with that, and that is practice. Hmm. And so we have got to give students an opportunity to practice. We should be asking them on a regular basis, what do you think about this issue? Right, wrong, in between, gray area. They've got to practice seeing the ethical dimensions of their technology use. And and you, you, I guess one way of doing that then is through these uh, conversations on scripted issues, such as um, the ethics around Google Glass, the ethics around a hat that makes you better in math. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, they they begin to talk about their digital lifestyles, which are invisible to them. They're just totally invisible to them. I had Marsha McLuhan as a teacher, and he would always talk wow. about figure ground. There's the ground, which you don't see, all the things around you that massage you, and there's figure the things that you do see, that small part that you do see. Well, their digital media landscape is ground. They don't see it. You have mm -hmm. to bring it to the figure and put it on the table and say, look at that for them to understand that there are that there is a reason to look at it, that there are that it can be problematic, that it uh, is imbued with opportunities and limitations. It's a far so cry from teaching geometry and English and so on. And just let me add quickly that I, I have been I have been advocating for a long time that digital citizenship take a more, take a broader foundation. I like character education, and I'm doing two of these webinars for character.org because I think what we're really talking about is we want them to develop character that allows them to apply the, that kind of thinking to being a digital citizen, yet mm -hmm. we need to carve out space in the school day to allow that to happen. Okay, so you know, I I had a thought, but I think it's even more important. Kim had a question. Uh, Kim is in her school. She's just getting uh, ready to develop a digital citizen citizenship plan in the school, 
and um, and they're getting ready to do PD with their staff um, and possibly send out a student survey about their digital habits. So I guess the first thing would be to send out a survey about the student's digital habits. The second thing would be the PD that they do with their staff. And the third thing would be um, the um, digital citizenship that uh, get the way they deal with digital citizenship with the students. So if you, if you take those three things, the, uh, the student survey, or maybe the four things, the student survey, uh, the plan, the PD with the staff, and then the actions with the students, how would you, do you have suggestions for her? Sure. I mean, I have, I have, uh, I have my wish list. Who doesn't have their wish list, right? Right. And mm -hmm. uh, I just suggested that she contact Nancy Willard. Who is my go-to person in terms of keeping Nancy? Who? Up with I'm sorry, I, I, I missed Willard. W I L L A R D. Yeah, and if I can find her, her okay. email here quickly, I will do that. One moment, let me do that. It's worth it. <clears throat> Let's see if I can multitask here. She knows more about the research that's already been conducted about uh, students. Uh, habits than anybody I know and so mm -hmm. rather than reinvent the wheel and I just I just posted that in my room rather than reinvent the wheel um, I, I would go to her I teach research at the PhD level and so I'm always telling my students stand on the backs of giants as Newton said find out who else has done this and save yourself a lot of time and gather a lot of insight about how to approach it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's where I would start. But uh, what I would want to know is what are the plans on the part of teachers to include students in the development of the digital citizenship program? Again, this is my bias, but if the adults make all the rules for the students, the students will game the system rather than frame the system. And you want but if them there's a the if there's a thousand students, how do you get a thousand students helping frame the system? Uh, uh, student council, you make it a big deal. You put out a, a, um, a request that goes to teachers, that goes to their homeroom students, or every student, every schools its own culture i find that all the time uh, mm -hmm. soliciting students who want to be part of an internet steering committee I, I think there are probably a thousand ways to do it each one is going to reflect the culture of the the school itself mm -hmm. okay and kim was thinking that maybe an online forum you know that that yeah, might be you know what? I would go, I maybe to, to find people, I would go old school. I want students in a room discussing internet policy, Facebook, and online. Okay. So, so just another thing that was occurring to me is, as you were talking before is, you know, you're saying you have to bring, uh, you have to make them aware of the you know of, of the digital environment and there's this old saw about that a fish doesn't even doesn't realize that it's in water and it's like you know it just seems to me that that's applicable here because the students don't think about what they're doing and it isn't until you bring it like hey you know something is this uh what do you think about this that all, that before that they weren't even thinking about it and yes. that's part of our role as adults to get them to think about things that they might just do without thinking about it yeah um let let me frame that a little differently but you're right you're absolutely right McLuhan loved to say that fish are the last to realize they're swimming in water uh very much that concept yeah, he probably got that from me <laughs> he probably got that from you <laughs> um there are two camps when it comes to digital citizenship i have found one is that current ethics that we that that preceded the digital age should be just as good for digital age as the industrial age. That is, we don't need digital citizenship. Citizenship will do. The second camp says that things are different enough that that doesn't work. My head is, my heart 
is with the first. Mm -hmm. My head is with the second because things are so different. And the example I love to use is theft. Back in the day, if I stole your car, I had your car and you didn't. These days, if I download your picture, you still have your picture. As a matter of fact, the entire world has your picture. You may not even care that I have your picture. I can even take your picture, pull it into Photoshop, change it so much that I now own it. It's called the policy of transformation, and it holds up in court. And another thing that's very different about it is that it all happens without our really being conscious about it because there is an expectation of collaboration and participation right now. And if I put stuff online, of course, you're going to grab it and sort of shoot it around the Internet. Why else did you put it online? That's sort of the new normal. And so we, we don't notice we're doing it because there are no immediate ethical implications of doing so, unlike taking somebody's car. And the area is so gray about, God, can I use this? How can I use this? And so on. And I've been involved in that issue for 30 years now. And it is just never clear. I think people really want to do the right thing. They just don't know what it is, which is why I set up what I consider to be the best single repository of copyright-free, hassle-free, uh, images on the internet that I can find anyway. If you go to jasonoller.com, resources and free photos, because I, I, you know, I guess what we do is really? we just go only those places where it's expressly stated. But the reality is that doesn't reflect the law because there are plenty of other ways that you can use that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Kim was saying that that one of the issues is we're taking kids and we're punishing them for doing things that we haven't given them any guidance about what the right right thing is. And, um, you know, on, on the other hand, you know, if they're doing something that, that is wrong, that could hurt them and could hurt somebody else, sometimes you have to bring an immediate stop to that. So maybe, so sometimes you do have to punish them, but, you know, it's just, it's a, um, you know, it's, it's a difficult choice, I, I, or it should well, be a difficult are, choice, I think. There are short-term and long-term, there are short-term and long-term solutions and safety first. And yes, put a stop to something that's not safe, absolutely. But if you want long-term solutions, if you want to take your shot at precluding that from happening again or in the first place, you involve students in thinking about this in a very deliberate way whether it's making policy, which I love, even if it's just pretend, or you infuse it into classes and ask questions during classes and mm -hmm. raise ethical issues so you get them to think about these things and see these things, or through direct instruction, here are the do's and don'ts, which I think have more limited value, but they absolutely need that experience that knowledge you can't expect somebody to see the implications of something that is largely invisible to them mm -hmm. and it's a little bit ironic here i mean it, I, we don't have an, enough people to really get into the discussion but here we are talking about that the most effective way of having long-term change is to involve people in a discussion uh, um, about the things that uh that about whatever the rules are or standards are and yet here uh we are and you're you're talking to us or maybe you know i'm questioning you but the people who are going to be watching this on the video they're going to be absorb you know hopefully absorbing some of it but it's not they're interacting with you right I, you know i just find that ironic that we're talking about involving people and yet here we are to a certain extent lecturing people well <laughs> we may not have a choice but um, you know what? It's real interesting. Um, I opened my new book with mm -hmm. one sentence on the front page, and it reads, yeah. once I was at a conference in which the keynote speaker declared that lecture was dead. He was so convincing, I got up and left. 
Yeah, and then right. <laughs> and, uh, the reality is we tend to gravitate towards the paradigm du jour, which tends mm -hmm. to be right now lecture is horrible. And the reality is that lecture isn't horrible. Bad lecture is horrible. And using nothing but lecture is horrible. But good, appropriately used lecture works very well. So something like talking to people coupled with activities, coupled with their own individual explorations, coupled with their their applications of what they learn in their own classrooms, that's that to me works. So this is just the presentation portion of that much larger equation. Mm -hmm. what, one of the things that you brought up and you're talking about, you know, multiple formats of interacting, multiple multiple media. Um, there's somebody who once said the media is the message, it seems to me, um, it, that if you are going to survey students about their digital habits, uh, there's two parts of that. One is, so what content would you ask them? What are the things that you would ask them about? But the second part is, how would you phrase those questions? So um, maybe you could come up with, with maybe three examples of things that you would ask students in a survey. And how would you ask the students in that survey? I have um, to put you on the yeah. spot. Well, survey development is, uh, there are all sorts of things that go into that in terms of how you word things. And you need to make surveys, make sure that responses are um, um, exclusive and mutually exclusive and exhaustive. And, and so if I, I put my researcher hat on, the guy who teaches research, there's that aspect of it. But what I sense you're asking is, what area do you address? And well, so, and how you address them. So the first is what areas should be addressed. And then how do you depersonalize them, the questions? Well, I, I think you're gonna ask all the obvious stuff about the technology they use. You know, here's here's the thing. It all depends. You could have a survey with 200 questions easily that asks about gaming, texting, whether you uh, Facebook use, Snapchat use. You could go right down the line. Or you could make it more text-based, and there are wonderful text-based analyzers out there. Now, you have to reduce things to numbers. I have a number of students who are taking um, – narrative answers and either calling them personally or in the case of large population sets, running them through those text analyzers and getting really quite valid and reliable data. But so, would, so you, would you ask a question, for example, how often do you sext with maybe some options? Never. Um, I've done it once. I'll never do it again. A few times I, um, I sext a lot. You know, that's kind of a controversial question. Is that something that you would ask in a school survey? That is something I would ask the school board or my principal whether I'm allowed to ask. And if I'm allowed to ask that, I would absolutely ask that. If that, again, I, I can't stress this enough, there are hundreds of questions like that to ask. If that is what you want to know, then ask that question. I tell my research students all the time, stop talking to me about methodology and surveys and tell me what it is you really want to know. And that's where you begin. You begin with your research question. And that that might be an expression. So I'm just going to interrupt you one second because I want to get I want to get Kim to to type something in because you made a really interesting point. So I'd like Kim if you could type in to either myself or or for Jason, what is it that you want to find out in the survey? Because I think that's the key thing that to me, the thing that I immediately latched on is you know, don't talk about the methodology. First, start out first with the end in mind. What is it that you want to get out of the survey, right? Did I paraphrase that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's what? What question? What big question are you trying to answer? And as she typing, as she is typing, I will, I will paraphrase Einstein, who said, if given a problem to solve, he would spend uh, in one hour, he would spend fifty-five minutes coming up with a question and five minutes coming up with the answer so 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 she just so she just asked you know uh we want to know what the students need to know in order to become digital citizens so that's 
good digital, you know, good digital citizens or whatever the term is that we want to use. So okay, if so why our am I goals, not seeing her questions? Well, she's actually just typing it to me. Um, oh, uh, we're in a um, actually. So Kim, if you can type this to Jason, then Jason can see the question, and it's probably even more important for him to see it than me. Uh, you're typing right now in my chat window. Can you type it in the other window, or in the um, in the IM that that say the room can see? But it, but while she's doing that, maybe you can answer uh, the one question. You know, their goal is to find out what is what is it that they have to uh, that the students don't know about digital citizenship, so that they can concentrate on filling that gap. Okay. Uh, what? Okay. Right. And that's a great question. And that's that's much more specific and much less methodology driven than do kids do this, do kids do this, do kids do this. Okay. So if I were, let's say you had hired me as a researcher and I was in charge of this project, I would ask some sample of teachers concerned about this issue what they thought those were and we mm -hmm. would distill those and come up with probably my guess is six to ten areas that uh, just experience tells me that that we could focus on we would then uh, and that might be um, unsafe behavior it might be um, helping behavior it might be um, when to ask an adult, uh, when to use a research, and so on. And mm -hmm. then we would come up with four questions, if we're doing it numerically, um, that, that would reflect that. The other, let, let me just give you another approach to this. In my book, Digital Community, Digital Citizen, I take the um, character education uh, part 11 principles of character education, and I suggest that they add to each of those 11 uh, specific criteria. They give you a sort of a blueprint. You ask whether these things are happening at your school to see whether you've satisfied that principle. And I suggested that they take, uh, that they add to each one of those uh, activities that reflect the digital domain, like uh, do they use netiquette? How important is netiquette to you? How important is it to you to help somebody else who's having an online problem? How important to you is it to post a written material and so on? And I just, I just really want to caution everybody who creates a questionnaire that it's not something you do lightly because you get that one shot. And so you really have to think about those questions you want to ask and how you want to ask them. Now, did you see a question from Kim on to appear on your screen? I don't. At all? Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, aha. Magic. Okay. I see it. And, and I think I just responded to that. And Kim, can you type in here and let me know? Did you get the... Did you get Nan Willard's email address? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. And again, okay, she's good. just this treasure trove of studies that have already been done. And you know, it just might stimulate how you how you frame your your own uh, data input. You know, probably I know we're over time. So yeah, I was just looking I, at like the time. Okay, I'd like to leave you with uh, sort of one key issue that's on the table right now in digital citizenship. No, no, no. I think people, with the amount people have paid to get in here, I think you have to leave them with two. One is enough. You have to leave them with two. Okay. Um, the one of the big issues that engages those of us in sort of at the sort of leadership realm of digital citizenship at this point only because people bring this issue to us is, do we have a separate digital citizenship curriculum or do we find a way to infuse it throughout the school day? And the answer is both. I mean, that's <laughs> the ideal situation. 
But where we really see traction in digital citizenship is in making uh, those kinds of digital citizenship issues a part of basically everything we do. So that can happen in biology class or history class and so on. And it can be as simple as asking a question at the end of a class that says, so were there any uh, digital citizenship issues uh, involved in what we did today? And you know what, typically there are. If you're in any kind of classroom that's involved with using modern resources, you sort of can't help it. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, it seems that we need some kind of baseline approach to give students a, a foundation about the whole digital citizenship um, issue and an umbrella that teachers can then feed into. I really try, so here's my second point. I, digital citizenship is best. Mike Ribble's book is great. And it shows that, it shows how vast it is. He has come up with nine elements, each one of which is huge. And so the is, oh God, how do I address digital commerce and digital safety and ergonomics and so on and so forth? I try to get schools to develop a brand, a digital citizenship brand, one sentence that describes their digital citizenship policy. And I've taken a number of groups of teachers through this and they come up with, um, we want students to use the internet safely and responsibly, for example. But then others want safely, responsibly, and in an inspired manner. And they want honesty in there. And others want in an appropriate manner. And they introduced me to a new word, which is protectively. That is, they want students to have the understanding that they should be looking out for themselves and each other. Mm -hmm. The best source of helping uh, other students will come from students themselves to look over their shoulders and say, wow, what are you doing there? But the idea is that if it's short enough and it's, and it's compact and meaningful enough that it can stimulate the kinds of conversations that parents need to have with their kids, teachers need to have with students, teachers need to have with each other. They can look over a student's shoulder and say, I'm not sure that that's really safe or that's not really very inspired. Why don't you try this and so on. And it's a great starting point for anybody who's wading into this vast arena called digital citizenship. So I know I said we were going to stop, but um, you know, Kim raises a really good point. point. Yeah, I know. But I'm going to go back to your first point, which is that to incorporate digital citizenship into a lot and of the you things are now that teachers frozen are going. on my screen. Oh, can you not hear me? Can you hear me now? You um you can't hear me, I guess, right? Darn. Because I think um, I can still hear you. You were frozen on my screen there for a bit, and I couldn't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, so yes. when, when we go back to your to your first point, you were mentioning that teachers uh, should be bringing up digital citizenship as examples. I can. I can hear you. Can you hear okay. me? Yes. 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 So you were you were bringing up the fact that uh, students, that teachers should digital digital citizenship as it as it occurs, as issues occur during the class. But teachers are already or overburdened with trying to. Uh, prepare kids for the tests for Common Core, et cetera. So, how do you get teacher buy-in when the teachers come back and say, "Yeah, but I'm, I already have too much I have to teach. Why do I have to pull? Uh, I just don't have time to pull digital, digital digital citizenship into what I'm dealing with with my students." Okay, I'm going to type it in for you. Sure. I mean, it's a great question because we already have an overcrowded curriculum. I, I, every project I do with teachers, I make the assumption they have no money and they have no time, and I'm usually right. <laughs> no, okay. I heard you.
I can okay. hear you just fine. Okay. So, um, so can you anyhow, hear me? it's I can hear you fine. Can but you it's now me? yes, I can hear you, uh, and I'll type it in. But okay. I think what I'm going to do. Okay. I can hear you uh, just fine. Okay. Good. So it's now about ten minutes after the hour, and okay. uh, so we've we've gone substantially over. And I found you know I've really enjoyed this conversation, and I've learned a lot. And I think that the archive is going to be very valuable okay. valuable for people. Uh, what I'd like to do is to figure out how we can get a large enough audience to get real conversations going among other people on this. So um, so maybe we can put our heads together sometime up? in the next month or so. And um, maybe we can do this again uh, sometime in the winter. Uh, that's what I'm hoping with a larger audience. Okay, I'm going to type it type it in for you. Maybe we can do this again. Okay, but um, but I think what I'm going to do is basically. At this point, say good night to everybody. Um, can you hear me right now? I can hear you fine. Um, okay, sure. Um, I'm. You know what? I'm. I've lived a life in which people have told me I I am crazy since 1984. When I, and they told me computers would never catch on. The internet would never catch on. Computers would never be used in art and storytelling. And digital citizenship is just sort of the latest thing that I, I think is, it's inevitable it's going to catch on. It's just slow to rise. Okay. So, well, thank you. And, um, um, yeah. Please encourage okay. Kim to contact me. Okay. And Kim, I hope... Um, you know, you can, uh, at the beginning, uh, Jason talked about his contact information. I know he's uh, Jason Oler on Twitter. Um, and you can certainly look him up on Google. Uh, and he may be actually typing in his email address to you uh, Again, now. Again, you're breaking up and I can't hear you. Okay. So I'm going to uh, sign off. And Kim, thank you. And Sam, thank you. Okay, so this is Mitch Weisberg. I'm uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive and hope to see you again at a future event, Kim, and uh, and everybody else who's watching this on the archive. I think you're, I hope you found it as fascinating as I did and hope to see you at future events. Uh, take care.